Chapter 4 An Opportunity for We the People Ourselves to Revitalize the Militia of the Several States Although inexcusable, the serial default by Congress and the states, embodied in the oxymoronic, unorganized militia, do not constitute an unmitigated disaster, because they provide we the people with a golden opportunity to revitalize the militia of the several states, and a largely clean statutory slate upon which to write. Indeed, the situation not only compels as a matter of legality, but also invites and even facilitates as a matter of practicality the organization within and by each of the states of true militia of the several states. These will consist of the huge mass of individuals, male and female, from 17 to 45 years of age, and not members of the National Guard whom Congress now lumps into the unorganized militia plus all those individuals from 16 to 17 and over 45 years of age, whom Congress has not designated as part of any supposed militia at all. For, by consigning the militia of the several states to this anarchy of unorganization, Congress necessarily cedes authority to the states and we the people to exercise our concurrent powers to organize these individuals in our militia as we see fit. And as exemplified by Virginia, having done nothing to organize the unorganized militia either, the states necessarily cede their authority, or at least the initiative in executing it, to the people. We the people must recognize, though, that this opportunity may be as fleeting as it is both fortuitous and felicitous. Today's Americans cannot expect succeeding generations to take these matters in hand, because this country's survival in the not-so-distant future may very well depend upon a remnant of present-day patriots, most of whom are forty or so years of age and older, who still understand and are committed to the concepts of national independence, of constitutionalism, and especially of limited government that in the first instance derives its, quote, just powers from the consent of the governed, and in the final analysis traces its authority to the laws of nature and of nature's God. Many of these individuals may have served in the armed forces, law enforcement, or some related private enterprise. Such individuals may be enthusiastic for honest homeland security, through the revitalized militia of the several states, and may very well volunteer in large numbers. They can begin the process and man the mechanism through which patriots can organize and especially educate the coming generations. Each year, however, this pool of self-conscious and experienced patriots diminishes. If the militia of the several states are not revitalized soon, they may never be, with all the dire consequences which that failure will entail for this country. So this project comes at a most critical moment in American history. Yet the timing is also propitious for numerous reasons. First, honest Americans of every political persuasion are deeply concerned with homeland security and the militia of the several states are the only establishments to which the Constitution expressly assigns the three primary duties of homeland security, namely, to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and to repel invasions. Second, many Americans are worried that incumbent politicians and bureaucrats, whether intentionally or negligently, will set up a national police state in the guise of, quote, homeland security. And as Joseph Story observed in a passage that cannot be repeated too often, the militia is the natural defense of a free country against domestic usurpation of power by rulers. It is against sound policy for a free people to keep up large military establishments and standing armies in time of peace both from the enormous expenses with which they are attended 
and the facile means which they afford to ambitious and unprincipled rulers to subvert the government or trample upon the rights of the people. The right of the citizens to keep and bear arms has justly been considered as the palladium of the liberties of the republic, since it offers a strong moral check against the usurpation and arbitrary power of rulers, and will generally, even if these are successful in the first instance, enable the people to resist and triumph over them. Third, a large majority of Americans have lost faith in, and indeed, are largely fed up with government and politics in general from the top down. These Americans will no longer tolerate politicians, bureaucrats, and judges' self-centered careerism, incompetence, and failures, or their aloofness to common Americans' concerns, or their elitism, hubris, and increasingly oppressive behavior. We want leadership with the intellectual capacity to formulate solutions to the problems of homeland security, and the personal integrity to carry them out as promised. And we realize that this will require restaffing and revitalizing, if not radically restructuring, our governments, local, state, and national, from the bottom up. Fourth. Tens of millions of Americans possess their own firearms and strongly support the Second Amendment's right of the people to keep and bear arms, and are even members of well-organized and well-funded private associations dedicated to the protection of that right. But most of these people know little about the militia clauses in the body of the Constitution, and even while relying on the Second Amendment's language of the right of the people to keep and bear arms, which shall not be infringed, leave out of their consideration the preceding phrase, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Some of them even imagine that the right of the people to keep and bear arms is strictly an individual, private right that is no necessary connection with a well-regulated militia notwithstanding that the amendment itself explicitly recognizes an inextricable interrelation between the two. Fortunately, that defect can be easily remedied. In historical fact and constitutional law, the militia of the several states and the right of the people to keep and bear arms are two sides of the selfsame coin. The militia of the several states are embodiments of the constitutional duty of individuals to keep and bear arms, which cannot be exercised effectively against the usurpation and arbitrary power of rulers if these malefactors can license themselves to deny every other individual's right to keep and bear arms. Thus, the strongest guarantee of the constitutional right to keep and bear arms is to revivify the constitutional duty to keep and bear arms through the militia. Gun owners comprise the largest constituency naturally motivated to recognize and are best organized to promote this connection. Fifth, although many Americans may not realize it, ever-growing numbers of them are already restoring at a personal level an actual connection between the right of the people to keep and bear arms and the militia of the several states. In recent years, a political movement has spread across this country in favor of so-called shall-issue licenses for private citizens to carry concealed firearms. This movement was not initiated by the establishment or its minions in state legislatures. To the contrary, the establishment, its kept politicians, its big media, and its hired intelligentsia vociferously opposed, even recognizing in the abstract, let alone facilitating in practice, the rights of ordinary citizens to carry concealed firearms. Shall issue licensure statutes were forced upon the establishment, state by state and from the bottom up by concerted grassroots campaigns, conducted by individuals in private organizations concerned about crime and personal protection and the right of the people to keep and bear arms. This is precisely the core group that can be expected to comprehend support and actively participate in homeland security 
which is based on the militia of the several states. People who understand their constitutional right to use firearms to protect themselves against crime in the streets will also understand their constitutional duty to use firearms to protect their own community, state, and country, not only against terrorism and such international criminal enterprises as the traffickers in illicit drugs and smugglers of illegal aliens, but also against the imposition of a national police state or any other manifestations of usurpation and tyranny, especially where that constitutional duty is implemented through the exercise of that constitutional right, and when implemented becomes that right's ultimate guarantor. After all, the constitutional power and duty of the militia to execute the laws of the Union are simply the natural law of personal self-defense writ large. For each individual who justifiably defends himself with a firearm is, in fact, executing the law then and there against his assailant. The opportunity to revitalize the militia of the several states offers several invaluable rewards. First, homeland security, based on the militia, will strongly emphasize the true homeland with local citizens performing all the basic security functions and local legal jurisdictions over their activities with local political control and local moral and social responsibility at work throughout. So revitalizing the militia of the several states will not only mobilize hundreds of thousands if not tens of millions of Americans on behalf of homeland security but will also foster constitutional federalism by dispersing their operations throughout the states and localities, rather than over-centralizing control in the general government. Second, revitalizing the militia will, in the most practical manner possible, guarantee the right of the people to keep and bear arms by eradicating general gun control at the national, state, and local levels. As this study uses the term, general gun control means the claim by public officials to exercise with unbridled discretion, complete and absolute supervision over the possession and use of any firearm by any individual for any reason. In particular, that mere possession of a firearm by any individual without statutory or administrative permission may be prohibited. That no individual who fails to satisfy certain criteria of fitness established by statute or administrative regulation may possess a firearm. That no individual who meets those criteria may possess or use a firearm for any purpose not licensed by some statute, administrative regulation, or judicial precedent. And that any violation of any such prohibition may be and usually is punished as a serious crime. The firearm involved will be confiscated, and the perpetrator will thereafter forfeit all of his gun rights. Thus, under general gun control, the right of the people to keep and bear arms is no longer constitutional, but entirely political. Public officials and the special interest groups which pull their strings decide who is allowed to possess a firearm on what terms and for what purposes, and sets the penalties to be inflicted upon those who violate their regulations. Self-evidently, though, with the revitalization of the militia of the several states, general gun control, and with it whatever contemporary gun control that to any degree embodies its perverse principles, will come to an abrupt end because almost every adult American will be armed, trained, and assigned specific duties as part of the permanent institutional structure of every state's government, in the form of the constitutionally well-regulated militia. Third, Homeland Security operating through the militia will thwart the establishment of a domestic police state by the general government or any of the states 
or internationalization of this country's security forces through treaties involving the United Nations or some other globalist institution. Fourth, revitalization of the militia will check usurpation and tyranny by rogue officials of the general government and the states, as well as promote other aspects of constitutionalism that will be inculcated in militiamen during their training and service. Fifth, revitalization of the militia of the several states will separate true from false Americans. For no one who opposes the militia can possibly support the security of a free state to which the militia are necessary, or a republican form of government, with which a free state is synonymous in the American legal lexicon, or the Constitution, which incorporates the militia as permanent parts of its federal structure, or the Declaration of Independence, under the aegis of which governments in America are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed and which asserts both the right and the duty of the people to throw off any self-styled government that engages in a long train of abuses and usurpations, evincing a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, or the laws of nature and of nature's God, upon which the Declaration, the Constitution, and every free state and republican form of government in America depend for their authority, just powers, and their rights to claim the allegiance of the people inhabiting this land. Sixth, revitalization of the militia and its separation of true from false Americans will create in every locality in which a militia company exists a new patriotic political forum wherein issues vital to localities, the states, and the nation can be identified and debated free from the pernicious control or influence of political parties, special interest groups, and other factions. End of chapter 4